let you know. Uh, practice exams take a little extra time. I don't get any extra money for it. My only obligation is to give you an exam and to grade it. So there could be only one motive for me to give you a practice test and have you look it over and study it, which is for you all to do well. Try and give you every single advantage. I can give you the answers, but I can give you lots of spoiler alerts. Uh, smart ways to deal with this exam, uh, by the way, is uh, when I taught in Costa Rica, I've taught twice, but the first time I taught in Costa Rica, I noticed something that the Costa Rican students, they would uh, get together, they'd look over like a practice test. Yeah, I've been doing practice tests for a long time. And they would kind of trade them with each other. Uh, they they come up with questions based on what I came up with. They would swap questions so they were kind of quizzing each other. And so the American students picked up from it. Why do I bring up Costa Rica? Costa Rica has literacy rates and education rates that are uh, approximating most first world countries, including the United States. And Costa Rica is a small country, not blessed with a ton of resources. Despite the name Rich Coast, it's almost like, ha ha ha, they'll even say down there, Costa Rica. Yeah, that's a good one. But they're able to pretty much get the uh, best bang for their buck for whatever they put anything into. Uh, great telecommunication system, uh, great hospital system uh, for a country. Health standards approaching the U.S., education standards approaching the U.S. So learn from them. When you study in groups, look over the exams. Come up with your own questions based on this because each question is some form of spoiler alert. I don't write the practice exam first, even though I need to give it to you first. I write your overall exam first, which is why most exams I have to write a week early. And then I come up with a practice test with as many ideas for you as possible. You can do one of two things. Just take today's, memorize the, current, certain, the questions that are on there, or you can take a look at it and say, hmm, is this a hint at what some other questions might be? If we look at one episode, maybe there's something, I might get a question that's similar to another thing we watched about it. Uh, something about America the Story of Us, can I come up with something similar? If there's a multiple choice question, might it appear in essay form or vice versa? Isn't this the case, Wes, when I teach in classes? In this case, Brandon? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I do. It's designed to help you. So you can do one of two things with it, use it or not use it. Uh, but nevertheless, you can't say I'm not trying to give you these advantages. So let's go over them. Okay, grade yourself. Now don't I mean, got to let me know how you're doing. So don't make the world's tiniest X or something like that. Got to let me know what you got right, what you got wrong. This lets me know uh, where you stand going on in. Okay, what did the Mythbusters find when they analyzed whether a sword can cut another sword? <coughs> Jacob Wood. Uh, if it's an authentic sword, it can't cut through it. But if it's like okay. a replica, the replica okay, so did cut through the... Did they ever find a sword cutting a sword? Yeah. Fake swords, maybe. Not the real ones. They cut it, but then at the end of the thing, they said it. Went to watch back and it snapped and mm -hmm. cut and do it. Okay, I can see where it would be worded. Yeah, uh, the cut sword was really snapped, was probably the best one. But yeah, I see where you, I see where we're coming from. This. Don't worry, that question won't be on this exactly. It's just a theory hint that we might have it. You might want to explain what they found. What were the pilgrims looking for in the New World? D. What do you got, Jordan? I said D. You put what? D. Oh, D. <laughs> they said E. I was going to say, there's no E. That is exactly right. Remember how they brought a lot of stuff to find gold? They didn't bring a lot of practical stuff. Positive uh, relationship is one in which, go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> what you got, Brandon? Oh, I ain't put D. D? Number four. Number four. No, I mean, you number agree three. with them, Jacob? Number three, D. Oh, number three, yeah, I D. On D, you both agree? I would agree, too. Which advantage should a rifle have over a musket? Bruno, what you got? 
from output accuracy over distances. You agree with them, Andy? What did we uh, test in the analytical method slides? Um, I put D. You put what? D. D. You grade them out? Okay, uh, Jefferson wrote all of the following except. to the U.S. document, one of the first free, if not the first free, constitutions ever written. What's, what you got? Who wrote the preamble to the Constitution? It's in our reading material. I mean, <coughs> what do you got, Tony? Madison. Madison, thank you. Isn't that weird? The guy is basically, more of his fingerprints are on the Constitution than any other human being's fingerprints in terms of authoring it. And all you're taught in grade school is shortest president. There's not even a statue of him in Washington, D.C. Seriously, there's a statue of him near his uh, plantation, which isn't as uh, Montpelier, uh, which is not near as uh, famous as Monticello or visited as much. But you can't find an American who had more influence on American government than James Madison. To say nothing of the Federalist Papers, which actually inspired the idea of them, and leading us through the War of 1812, where we were nearly conquered by a superpower, the British. And all we get, we don't have a single statue for him anywhere. So, if you don't know, it may not be your fault. But make sure you do know. Which of the following best describes what a dependent variable is? Canarius, what do you got for me? You agree with the West? That's what I believe. C for a dependent variable? I thought BD. BD. Anybody got it? I think it's D. B. B. Well, <laughs> there we go. Nobody put the correct answer? C. C. Possibly explained by the dependent variable. Independent, independent variable possibly explains a dependent variable. Would be would be like a cause No, it's the effect. No, cause has an impact on the effect. So independent variable is the cause. Yeah, or well, you don't want to actually say cause, but the, in a cause and effect model, that's what it would be. You're looking to see if the independent variable, the cause, has an effect on the dependent variable. So the dependent variable. So like the amount of the amount that you study is your independent variable. The results on the test are the dependent variable. So how much study you have has an impact on your dependent variable. You've got to know those for the exam, the first exam. Those analytical thinking slides, got to know them. Remember I said if you got to print out one set of slides, print out those set. I meant it. De Tocqueville was from, what you got? Oh, did you get it? Yeah. And wrote about, excellent. We discussed number nine. Remember, theory, hypothesis, <coughs> variables, and their relationship to each other. What I did is I gave you an example of what I'm looking for in an essay. It provides a heck of a lot more uh, detail, but I'm just giving you as an example of how to work in explaining relationships, variables, theory, and hypothesis. 
You don't need to focus on the details of my particular study. I just did one that could apply in my American government or uh, American experience class. Does that make sense? You obviously don't have to do blood pressure readings, and I did an alternate test because I'm showing it to my research method students. So, but the most important thing is look at how, up till I found, and this is kind of what I want you to look at when you're covering independent and dependent variables. What's a theory? What's a hypothesis? Note that they're not carbon copies of each other. Otherwise, why have different terms? One is an abstract connection between variables. One is more specific, testable version of it. So in this particular study I did on Monday night, I looked at a theory look, seeing whether or not watching a political event, uh, how much the, in, this independent variable, watching a political event would have on one's stress levels, the dependent variable. In other words, if you watch something stressful, does your blood pressure go up? So that's what the hypothesis is. I watched the pre first presidential debate, and I took my blood pressure readings. So remember, stress in general, watching any political event, or watching a sporting event. Do you understand how that works? Because watching something on TV, the effect, what it does to your blood, uh, what it does to your stress level. You can measure stress many different ways. I chose blood pressure. Do you understand how that works? I hope so for, for uh, Friday's exam. So if you don't, I gave you a uh, typed up example. Y'all want me to load this up on Connect? Yeah. Okay, stop me at 925 so I can load it up immediately. And I'll put it, uh, I think there'll be like sample works. I'll say sample works and practice tests. I'll post it up there. So y'all have access to it. Now what I did is I decided to do, uh, I decided to do a pre-test, test and post-test for my research methods because I'm showing them how it works. So I took my blood pressure readings before watching the debate, before they all started talking. Then I took it in the middle of watching the debate. Then I took it afterwards. And here's what I found. Incidentally, 150 is the beginning of stage two hypertension. any event might, you know, as opposed to being in, a, being in a room with all the TV off and nothing going on. So, being a sports fan, I decided to watch the fourth quarter of the Atlanta Falcons New Orleans Saints game. So, turned off the TV, took the test calmly, and then right in the middle of the fourth quarter when like New Orleans was rallying, Atlanta had a lead, but New Orleans was trying to catch up. I took it right in the middle of that. And then after the results were over, I turned it off. So what do you notice? Y'all know much about blood pressure? Always good to have that checked out. Yeah, you don't wanna you don't want to get readings over 140. 140 to 150 is stage one hypertension. Stage two hypertension is 150 to 160. And Anything over 180 is hypersensitivity. If you get a reading over 180, it's a good time to visit uh, West Georgia Hospital, not just the clinic. If you get over a 140, you might want to visit the We Care Clinic. If you get over a 180 on top, uh, you may want to want to get that checked out. Actually, the re uh, reason I got interested is a friend of ours from Trivi started showing some of this, and his readings were about 200. So yeah, they hospitalized him overnight. You know, so he wouldn't die. All I can say is he is the biggest Cubs fan. He's gone to the four games this year, driven all the way up to see a Cubs game. I'm almost terrified what will happen in the World Series. <laughs> but do you understand? I just thought you'd find that, that little bit interesting on blood pressure. But the point is to focus on this section. So if you want an idea of what I'm looking for in a write-up, Go with that. So, looking for a lot of detail. You get a choice of essay questions. See, I'm giving you every advantage I can. 
Understand that sometimes you might you might be missing uh, video might be uh, might not be loaded up the file might be corrupted or something like that. You may be out you're uh, at a sporting event or you got to travel to a wedding or something like that. I get that. That's why I give you a choice of multiple choice questions, a choice of essay questions, giving you a sample. We're going over in class. Answer key going on up. You've got every chance to succeed. Don't sit back and go, oh, I don't have to study hard. Study extra hard. Why not take advantage of this as an A? I can tell you a class. It was an English class, British Literature 1. I had an A in that class. It was easy for me. And I thought, I didn't even have to study really hard in the final. And I took an A and I managed to move it down to a B plus. I keep thinking, out of all the grades I've had, that one bothers me. That's in my top five. Like grades going back to kindergarten and art. That's one that I'm like, dang it. It was a good professor. He was a great guy. His lecture style was great. He got us interested in British literature. You know, and I just figured I didn't have to study as hard. And it still burns me that I, that I didn't put in my all. But I'm a different person than I am as a sophomore, but still, still gets out. So don't, don't take something you regret. I, you know, if you get an A, if everyone gets an A, I'm cool with that. I don't, it's not med school where it's like, Five people get A's, 10 people get B's, 15 people get C's, the rest get D's and F's, and all the grades are predetermined. You're in competition with each other. Okay, maybe it's not like that in med school, but it darn near used to be. You don't believe me, watch the beginning of the movie, Flatliners. Really cool movie we saw in college. Everyone looked at me like, oh my gosh, is it like that? My dad went to med school, I said, yeah, I got it. You're graded in competition. Yet. No, everybody gets an A. Everybody gets an A. Y'all run a mile in eight minutes. Y'all, I don't, I don't grade you first to whatever point. I've actually had a class that I had a summer class I was teaching, where uh, out of the 20 people I taught, 17 got an A or B. So I got taken into the dean of students, uh, not dean, the, the uh, academic dean for social sciences. They contacted me and said, come into office. And they said, this is down in Florida State, they said, we've heard stories of uh, rampant grade inflation, where graduate students who were teaching courses were handing out A's and B's all over the place just so uh, people would give them really good evaluations and they could go on to get jobs. So, they, uh, so I showed them my test, showed them the papers, how I graded, they looked it over, they said, right on, good job. Keep going. So I will grade you just as tough as anything else. But if I ever get called in to somebody else to, you know, on the issue of grade inflation, my job is to give you all the opportunities you can to get an A. I'll handle defending what your A or B is worth. Sound fair? So don't disappoint me. Wes, why do I want everyone to get an A? Do you remember? What's my cynical reason? Tony, do you remember? Why I want everyone to get an A? What? Oh, yeah, well, you, I do want you all to be good people. Oh, you mean? No, I tested in the slender. I grade hard. I really do. I look for, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that you earn it. Slytherin. Remember Slytherin. I'm going to wear my Slytherin butt. So don't think I'm an easy grader. My idea is to get you as well prepared so you can beat a Slytherin, all you Gryffindors. You got it? Now, why do I grade? Nobody grade it? You don't remember? Because when you get an A, it's a lot easier to grade an A. I don't have to make as many comments. I can get done early. I'm going to be grading your papers on the plane, the plane to Washington, D.C. Make my job easier. Slytherins are mean, but they also like things to be easy. To so if you make a lot of errors, if it, then it, you have to do more work. That's why I do all the work before your exam, extra exams answer keys. Uh, 9.30 to 10.30, Thursday night. I'm going to be here somewhere in the library. I think my American government students, a couple of them want to meet with me because they got an exam. Track me down if you got questions, okay? Thursday night? Thursday night, 9.30 to 10.30. And if you can't be there, send questions on with someone who can. So chat with each other. Why am I meeting an hour after trivia? That's usually when we celebrate our victory. Why am I doing this? Why am I going to be missing Thursday night football? Any ideas? 
I don't get extra points. I don't get extra pay for doing it. Must be for some other reason. So take advantage of this. All right. Somebody tell me about Alexis de Tocqueville. Who is Alexis de Tocqueville? No, it is not a she. This guy's name is Frank. From France. From France. Okay, we got that down. <laughs> what else do we know? Have you ever heard the name Alexis de Tocqueville before this class? You're nodding. Why? Where did you come across that? Uh, never. never, really. They mentioned him much in DC. <coughs> Nobody mentioned Alexis. He wrote, he wrote a book called Democracy in America. One, this is an excerpt from it. It's like one of the most seminal looks at not just American politics, but American culture as well. Alexis de Tocqueville, do you know he starts from? Anybody? Why he was even in the United States? He's a French person, he's not an immigrant. He is coming over from France to study American prisons. Like why Americans set up the prisons the way they do. France had some pretty mean prisons, like St. Hel <laughs> Helena, way out, uh, way out in the South Atlantic, Devil's Island. You see the movie Papillon, you get to realize France had some pretty mean prisons. They look like something out of Scooby Doo. Like where they have some, you know, they visit, for some reason they're visiting some old jail, and there's some guy with a big iron face chasing after them. They'll play them a lot, I'm sure, in October for Halloween on Cartoon Network. Yeah, but he started when he was there, he was just so fascinated by everything he saw in America because he realized that most. Most of the people he met were of European ancestry, and yet these European Americans didn't act anything like Europeans. They acted very differently. So he wrote about all the differences that he found. So you can just write about prisons. It's another good thing to know. I mean, sometimes you study one thing, it never hurts to pick up a couple other things along the way. So he wrote about gender differences in America and France. What are some of these gender differences? How do men treat women? What are women like? Compare them. France and America. Oh, well, in America, men are more respectful of women. And in France, men are a lot more. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by respect? Well, they don't really like. They don't think that's right. They try to like watch the faces of others. It is kind of. Because there's two different types of respect that you'll get in Europe versus America. Go ahead, Jacob. Uh, he was saying their honor is a lot more guarded here, and if they're like raped or something, the punishments are much more strict than they are in France. Yeah, there are some differences. Now, when you say respect, there are certain types. European men versus women. Like, you can see in Europe, the story, you know, what do you expect? Okay, well, the guy whips off his cape. Places it on down over the mud, over the mud, so some lady can walk over it. In America, not so much. <laughs> First off, guys don't wear capes in America. <laughs> you get beaten up. Okay, only Superman and uh, maybe Batman can get away with it. <laughs> no cape. In Europe. Men are more likely to read romantic poetry to women. In America, not so much. A country western song is about the best you can get. I remember seeing a great ad. It was up in Atlanta when we first moved down here. It was in 2002. Giant billboard. And it says in big letters, Shakespeare would have written her a sonnet. You're not Shakespeare. 1-800-Flowers.com. <laughs> Don't even try, dude. Because <laughs> you're just going to get it wrong. That's American men for you. Lots of compliments, lots of compliments that uh, uh, European men voiced upon European women. Holding doors. What do you think? Europe more than men, America. Bounding ahead to open the door with a grand flourish. What do you think? <laughs> America, not so much. Unless it's a 10-gallon hat you do. 
the new Texans aren't like Europeans that we're really good men. But you're pointing out that there's something else going on too. When we use the term respect, different, you know, different ideas about it, right? One may be more the romantic. De Tocco writes about uh, men putting women up upon a pedestal more so than in America. But as Jacob's pointing out, respect in terms of the honor of women is very different in America. Yes, it's, I mean, you know, they both come from the same, <laughs> they both come from the same area, yet they act very differently. How about in the way of compliments? American men. They don't give compliments. Or do they? If so, what kinds of compliments? <coughs> if I said the name Rosie the Riveter, would you have ever heard that before? No, never heard. What was Rosie the Riveter? The woman on the ad that like has a bandana around her head. Okay. World War II, right? Woman with the bandana. By the way, Carol King, who came to speak to our class, she goes around to like grade school sometimes, and she'll dress up like Rosie the Riveter and tell her story. You know what a Riveter is, right? The person, you know, he's got like a big old nail gun and you're putting rivets into something. It's not, you know, it's not easy. It's like handling a jackhammer or something. So she seems somewhat muscular. She's usually like pumping her fist. The second, uh, it's not seen as much because it's sort of a product of its times. You know, the, like women can do it. Women can do the job. That's the more popular Rosie of the River. There's another one you probably haven't seen. I saw it down in the Warm Springs. Anybody been to the FDR yeah. museum down there? And it was on a coffee mug, and I had it for the longest time, and somebody swiped it from me. I forget who. I probably left it behind the classroom, so we went, <laughs> and took it. So I got to get me another one. I used to take my American Experience class down to uh, Warm Springs. It was kind of a neat field trip. And, and we get a bunch of work down on the calendar. But at any rate, it's Rosie the Riveter, and she's sitting down with a male counterpart, and they're having lunch together. And he's, and he's saying to her, and keep in mind, this is an ad for encouraging women to work in industry during World War II. She, he says, great job, sister. Who knew you could work as hard as a man? Maybe that's why you don't see it here as much. <laughs> so American men do give compliments. <laughs> but those are the guys like, wow. And she has the look of, oh, okay. Not sure how to take this. Of a backhanded compliment. <laughs> but there you have it. Like, wow, you shot that deer in a field dressed it just as good as any man. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's the kind that you get. Not the same level of romance, of course. I thought I'd leave you, uh, we'll talk later about images, but I thought I'd leave you with one thing as you're packing up and getting ready to go. Anybody ever watch Warner Brothers cartoons? Yes. See, because the European men are more romantic toward uh, American. But there's also this idea of, ah, oh, the women don't know any better, and so they must be pursued over and over and over again. Which sometimes causes some of the problems Jacob Woods was talking about. trying to say no, she's just being hard to get. So, don't mind to talk those French and he's writing about this. He's saying, this is how European men are. Very persistent. Your person is not a skunk, it's a cat. Now, these came out in the 1950s when like, a lot of Americans after World War II went over and visited Europe. And I think a number of women complaining uh, led animators to, uh, to contribute these because women were starting to get into the animation fields in the 1950s a little bit on a grander scale.